so yeah, I'm, I'm Michael. Um, in this audience, I'm a biologist. So uh, the, uh, yeah, I will, I will try and tell you a bit about the, um, the biology more than the uh, inference. Um, but I will show you one, one inference method to start with uh, that you probably haven't come across because it's <laughs> insanely domain specific. Um, so yeah, there's me. I wasn't sure if it was going to be like a YouTube only thing. Um, there's, there's Gary. He came up with most of the stuff. Um, uh, well, he, he organized most of this. There's a lot of the ideas in this are his. Uh, this is Kylie. She did most of the experiments that you'll see, um, as well as lots of the analysis. Uh, there's Chan, you'll see him on the very final slides, and there's Dave, who was everybody else's supervisor at one point in their career. Um, yeah. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So, you're having a lovely day thinking about some uh, evidence, I guess. Um, meanwhile, your heart is beating, and every time your heart beats, um, this uh, several pumps, you know, in your heart, they make this kind of sort of V movement. Uh, very nicely coordinated. Uh, if it loses coordination, it doesn't pump well, and usually you die. Um, so how's this, how's this organized? Uh, it's not organized in a central way, it's decentralized. Every cell, when it starts contracting, tells its neighboring cells to also contract. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. Uh, how do the cells talk to each other? Well, they do so electrically. Um, so if you're used to electricity being just moving electrons, in biology it's, it's moving ions. And anything that isn't an electron, that also moves. That's basically bioelectricity. Uh, and the way that these cells generate the electrical signals, um, well, there's things called pumps and exchangers, but there's also what I'm going to talk about is ion channels. Um, they don't really look like this. This is actually based on 3D data, but it's like, you know, you freeze 100 million of them. And then, so they, <laughs> we don't really know what they look like, uh, which is a shame for me. So they're really big molecules. They can open and close. Um, based on drugs being present. The ones that I'm going to talk about, they open and close based on voltage. So you can see I've drawn a little sort of cell membrane, so there's a different amount of charge here than there is there, so you get a voltage difference. Um, and this causes a conformational change, uh, which means that things opens and closes. Um, then we can measure that by getting a very sharp um, glass pipette. You hold it against the cell and then you, um, well, you literally have like a little tube attached and you suck on it and some of the cell membrane goes in your pipette. Um, then you suck a little bit harder and it breaks. Uh, it's called a kiss. So you get like, you know, so we can joke at conferences with other electrophysiologists about who's like the best kisser in the lab. Um, <laughs> it's an important thing. Uh, and then, yeah, you can set up something that basically looks like this, where you have a cell on a little plate, you have your electrode attached to it, um, your, your glass pipette attached to it, there's liquid in the pipette, uh, and then you stick an electrode there, and you stick an electrode there, and now you can me measure currents, apply voltages. Um, right, and then when you apply a certain voltage, you might see a current that looks like this, and then we're going to sample it, and that gives us time series, and that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, for the heart, a combination of all these things leads to this action potential, we call it, that uh, cells use to communicate. Um, which leads to propagation of an electrical wave over the heart, which leads to like an ECG. I can measure this and you can do inference at all these stages. You can try to do the backwards problem. Um, crucially, uh, if you find like small changes, so say uh, the effects of drugs or mutations, we can then redo the forward analysis and hopefully show whether or not this uh, tiny molecular change actually has an effect. Um, whether or not we can really do that properly is a big open question. I don't really think so because, we, yeah, if, you know, <laughs> if the system was this sensitive, we'd all be dead. But um, different topic. But ask me about that, please. Uh, right. So, ion currents. This is what I'm going to talk about then. The example we'll be using is IKR. Uh, I for current and KR because it's potassium. Um, now, it's pretty well studied. Uh, here's um, a bunch of different models, something like 40 different models. Uh, at the top, this is the input. So the, there's an input time series of voltage, there's an output time series of current. I see all these models have quite different predictions, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. But uh, yeah, this is going to be our example. So how do we know this? I'm going to tell you about the simplest possible model that we really have of IKR. Um, well, we know that it does two things. It opens and it closes, um, but we call this activation. And then it has a second, second uh, independent process, which we call inactivation. Um, so basically, in this cartoon, you can see there's a top bit that can open and close and a bottom bit that can open and close. 
Um, and you can model them as dependent, but today we're modeling them as independent. Um, so if you think of them chemical processes, you can just write down really simple equations. We can have an activation uh, variable called A, um, an inactivation variable instead of well, we're using recovery from inactivation, which is what we call the opposite, just to make it confusing. So we have a recovery variable called R, um, and then you can model either, well, the probability of being in one stage, you can call A, and then you get one minus A is the probability of being in the other one. Or the way that I'm going to talk about it is, is we assume there's loads of ion channels, and so uh, you can think, think of A as the fraction of channels in this state. Um, then how do we observe it? Well, we observe the current that goes through them, um, which is then the product of these two states. Uh, times our input minus some offset and times this g, which is, is one of the model parameters. Um, all right, you can write down, based on that, you can just write down um, simple equations that give you this. So this is, this is our model. We have two uh, ordinary differential equations here, each bit given by just like a chemical uh, scheme. Um, and these rates, these uh, reaction rates here, they have um, a voltage independence part and a voltage dependent part. And those are our parameters. So the model ultimately has four of these rates, giving you eight parameters. So four A's, four B's, one G. Uh, that's a nine parameter, yeah. Um, now, there's a nicer way to write this that makes the equations make more sense. Oh, yeah, right, that's the output states. So a nicer way to write this is if you do rewrite it like this, you can have it as a time constant and a steady state value. Um, and then these uh, ordinary differential equations are easier to understand because you can just see, well, if, if A is bigger than its steady state value, then it's going to uh, shrink. If A is smaller, it's going to, yeah. And this time constant either speeds up or slows it down. Now, why am I going in such depth about the model is because the first inference method I'm going to show is a pen and paper one that um, people have been doing for ages um, that, you know, lets you find parameters, work backwards. So um, I'm going to go in slightly more depth still to this. Uh, after that, I promise it gets easier, but yeah. So how did people work out how to get parameters for this? Well, um, domain knowledge is the answer. So the first thing that you have to know is that, well, these two processes, uh, one of them is a lot faster than the other. Um, so uh, this is the fast direction, this is the slow direction. Cool, we can do a phase plane analysis, yeah. Um, another thing that you have to bear in mind is that um, because the current that we measure is the product of A times R. Over here you get the maximum current, over here you get no current, but over here you also don't get any current, right? So basically this whole area is um, either get no currents or you get currents with a very poor signal to uh, noise ratio. So if you want to learn about, yeah, and then it happens, again, more domain knowledge, the steady states are all kind of in this area. So if you want to learn where these steady states are for different voltages, you can't actually do it by just going to that steady state and staying there because you don't observe anything. Uh, instead, what you need to do is you need to find some way to like jump and then still learn something about that. Um, so here's an example of, of what people have come up with, so experimental design then to do these things. Is, um, well, you start somewhere where you have some idea, um, and now we go to a voltage that you want to learn about, so in this case like 30 millivolts, and the system then quickly, because this is a rapid uh, direction, moves down and then slowly approaches this steady state. Okay, so now you, you, you guess that you're in the steady state, you don't know because you can't observe it. Um, and then what you do is you do something, you, you jump out and you get this big current and then hopefully you can learn something about where you used to be <laughs> a few seconds ago. Um, and so if you want to learn about steady states, for example, of activation, you can do this particular protocol that people came up with. I don't know how long it took them to come up with this, but it, they, they did come up with it. <laughs> um, Whereas, so what they do is they jump to all these different positions on this line, and you can see they're kind of approaching the steady state, and then you jump to this other voltage um, where the system really quickly recovers and then starts uh, deactivating. Um, but because this is so quick, the left-right movement is almost zero. So, um, and because you always jump to the same voltage, and this is quickly goes to the steady state, uh, the R variable here is pretty much constant for all the peaks of your current that you measure. And so you can normalize it out. So you can just normalization gets rid of one of the states here. Um, yeah, and then you can check by doing it, simulating this, that you can actually reasonably approximate a model variable like this. So now you have um, one of these four variables 
Um, so you've still got, yeah, and you can get two parameters from that. And so then you have to come up with another equally complicated one for all of the other uh, variables. And then eventually you have this, you have like a long series of experimental protocols, each of which give you these variables, uh, these, these um, steady states and time constants as a function of voltage. And then you can do some more curve fitting to find like a line that'll go through that to actually get your parameters. So uh, this is how the electrophysiologists do it. Um, they don't do it with phase plane analysis because they've forgotten that they're modeling. They think that they're doing experiments, but they're actually parameterizing a model. Uh, so I think it's interesting. Um, and then what they publish is usually these, these blue dots and red dots here, which are the outcome of an experiment. Um, so then modelers, of course, well, they, well, so this is what I've called method one of fitting. Um, it has some downsides, uh, very established. Now, modelers, they don't like this two-state model. They think it's too simple. It's, uh, you know, ion channel has like um, a billion conformational states or something. So to model it as like two is, is maybe too little. Um, <laughs> at the same time, you know, we like simplicity. Um, but this is the published data. So modelers started doing this method where they simulate these experiments, um, they derive the same summary statistics, and then they fit to these summary statistics. So this is what I call method two. And this is hugely popular. Um, and the main reason this is popular is because you don't need to cooperate. You can just download a paper and you can re-digitize these points and fit to that. Done. Um, yeah. Yeah, so invented by modelers. Um, slightly better than method one at getting good fits. <laughs> Um, we'll talk about predictions later. It allows you to fit much more complicated models to the data that was actually generated on the basis of simpler models. You don't need to cooperate. Um, then if you think about it a bit more, you go like, well, why do we need these summary statistics? If we have this data, why not just fit to this data directly? And that's what I call method three. Um, this one requires the experimenter to give you the time series data, which they don't usually do because you couldn't do it in the 90s. And yeah, that, that's it. That's the full explanation. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah. Even some of the software that we use still um, has like built-in limits of file sizes at like 1.4 megabytes, which if you're the right age, it's a floppy disk, right? So, and I, I tried once to get the new, uh, to update the uh, software we had in our lab, um, and it cost 16,000 pounds to get the, uh, get the software. And I thought, okay, maybe it's worth it. And then I saw on the offer also it said, um, 100 pounds of that was for them sending me the USB drive through the post. So I was like, okay, fine. So we can't update the software, we've got practical issues, right. Um, but if you can do this, uh, you get nice results. And actually more than uh, every decade, somebody has written a paper saying that, you know, this method is better than method two. And uh, I'm the one in the 2010s, so. That's, you know, in a long list of people sort of flogging a dead horse. Um, yeah. And then once you start thinking about this, you think, well, why are we using these protocols that are for method one if we're not doing method one? So then you get what we call method four, which is where you do a, a shorter protocol that is easier to do experimentally, but gives you the same information or hopefully even more information. So what we did in uh, 2019, um, we got data from these protocols and from a new protocol and from an independent validation protocol. Um, and we started comparing them. I say we got that data, Kylie did that. Uh, um, but after she'd published her paper, I got to have a go with paper, like comparing these protocols and doing a bit of methodology. So that's, that's why I'm here. Uh, so we measured like the old new ones. We did this for, loads, for nine cells. Um, yeah, to do the fitting, we have to put some inference in. We used CMAS for the optimization using a root mean square between the traces or between the summary statistics, or you had to do some weighting, and it's, it's all very standard. Um, and then we made predictions to test which of these methods was the best. So here's an example of that. Uh, you can see um, this is a bit of cross-validation. So these are the protocols that um, Method three here was fit to, so this one is a fit, and you can see it fits best. These other ones are predictions, so you can see they're not as good. Um, yeah, you can see method four here does reasonably well at this one, it does reasonably well at that one and that one. This one, not so good. Um, 
you can see method two here is kind of all over the place and a lot of them method one seems to do okay which is kind of cool for a pen and paper method from the 50s right uh, and then for the novel protocol, we kind of saw the same uh, picture. Um, well, this is the fit, so it works best. But this prediction here is pretty spot on in most cases. Sorry. Uh, method two does very poorly. Again, method one seems to do a bit better, which is kind of kind of weird because this one is like you know optimization and everything. Um, yeah, and then finally, the thing that really matters is the independent validation protocol. Uh, we saw again same story. These two just work better than those two. Um, and you could argue that this one is slightly better than that one. Okay, then we looked at like other factors of like, well, how how well are we doing? Um, the analysis duration, you can see, well, this method two takes forever and ever to run, and I've cut off loads of outliers here, so sorry, wrong audience to do that for. Um, but yeah, you can see method four just much faster than method three because the protocol is so much shorter. Um, then we looked at something else. Um, we looked at the robustness. So by this, what I mean is how often did we get the result that had that was the best result. So we have a prior, we sample from the prior, we run our optimization, and we do this uh, 100 times, and then see, well, which fraction gives something within 1% of the lowest score we observed. Um, and for methods three and four, that was quite a high fraction. It was over 50% for most cells. Um, for method two, pretty poor. In some cases, you only had like one cell that had the best result, which you know, if you can't even get it twice in 100 runs, probably means there's, there's no guarantee that that's actually an optimum, right? Um, we did a second thing just to check for an identifiability that's, that's not shown on the slide, but uh, we also looked at how many of those that had the lowest score um, also were in close in parameter space. And there we found that 100% for method three and four were also close in parameter space. And in method two, we had some of these low numbers. They also weren't actually the same point, so yeah. Again, another issue. Uh, so why is it so bad? Um, this is the first slide that you might actually like. Uh, <laughs> we looked at the, the score functions. We, we, we plotted them. So this is uh, parameter 1 versus parameter 2. This is parameter 3 versus 4. The rest all held constant at the optimum. Um, and methods 3 and 4 here, they actually look pretty smooth. Looks um, Almost looks like an easy problem. Like after we saw this, we went and tried simpler optimizers but this hides if you zoom in on this you can see that actually it's a very noisy surface so you still need uh, quite a, a clever optimizer so cmas works really well for example because it has a sample of like 10 points or something and it adapts to noise but if you have, if you use a more traditional method that doesn't allow for uh, noise then you can't actually fit this but method two here just looks awful you can see all these really weird things going on in your score function just full and full and full of local optima. Um, and then after a lot of thinking, we realized, well, the reason that those are all in there are, is because of the summary statistic calculation. It's, a, it's an algorithm. It's got lots of branching. It can fail. It can go, you know, there's if statements in there. So basically, by fitting to the summary statistics and by doing what we thought was like, well, what everybody does um, or what seems to make sense, you're actually making the problem impossible for your optimizer. So, any paper you write saying which is the best optimizer for this, it's well, there isn't one because you're making the problem impossible by just posing it in a bad way. So this is kind of the main thing that we learned. Um, yeah. Right, so take home messages uh, then. Uh, avoid non-smooth algorithms if you can. You know, summary statistics can be really, really dangerous is what we've discovered. Um, understanding where your data comes from can help you actually solve problems that, you know, we were trying to solve this with inference for ages until we kind of looked at the problem properly and went, okay, <laughs> not going to help. Um, and experimental design is uh, something we've maybe not talked about that much here, but it's, it, you know, it can be thought of as an inference technique. Um, right, some open questions that we have. So we would like to do uncertainty quantification on this type of model. And we've, we've done it, um, but in what might not be the best way. So we've basically taken our output, which is current, we've added normal noise to this, a noise term, and now all of a sudden you get like, um, it becomes a stochastic model, you can do sampling. And then what it tells you, it gives you these incredibly narrow posteriors, it says, hey, well done, you found the parameters to within an incredible tolerance. But really the question that we've asked here is, how likely is this discrepancy? How likely am I to get that from sampling a million points from a normal distribution? And the answer is very, very, very unlikely. 
right? So that's why they're so narrow. So it's, 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 we've just not posed a question well. Um, we've tried to pose a question better by writing an experimental error model where we say, okay, now the input becomes some complicated function of what we think it should be. Uh, the output is some complicated function. And we can actually show that this gives uh, better predictions in some cases. Uh, so this is something John did. Um, I'm running close to the edge of time, so I'll, I'll leave it. But basically what we tested was that if we um, make the error model more complex and uh, fit several cells at the same time, assuming that the cells have the same kinetics, so the biology is the same, but the experimental influence is different, we got slightly better predictions um, or better distribution of predictions over these cells. But, you know, that still, uh, you can see just in these graphs, you can see that the models don't fit, right? So it's still a very open question. So, um, yeah, if anybody has big ideas on that, we'd love to hear them. Like, how can you do uncertainty quantification if you don't really believe that your model is right, um, but you've tried the alternatives and they give worse predictions, <laughs> which we've done? Uh, yeah, is, is this even, I don't know if it's even a proper question, um, but yeah. Uh, so our, our, our leader, team leader, Gary, was once told at a conference that the stuff he was doing was at the forefront of model discrepancy, which is, you know, I like to think that's about how good our models are. But <laughs> yeah, so if anybody has ideas for that, I'd love to hear them. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Michael. So any questions? Um, really great talk, thank you. Um, can you tell us how the um, experimental inputs were designed in method four? For method four? Yeah. Um, trial and error. Uh, yeah. We've, uh, we have been thinking a lot about how to do this. Um, John Locke uh, has uh, actually used optima well, optimal design techniques as well. Um, and we've uh, used a sort of state space representation as well to think of like maybe we should like fill that up, make sure we cover every area. Um, so we've, we have ideas, uh, we've tried things. We don't really have a good thing. You know, I can't say this is how you should do it yet. We've, we've, we've tried several things. One of the issues there again is kind of sort of model discrepancy given that we know that the model is wrong. If we do an optimal design based on our wrong model, it might, you know, it not, might, might end up um, not working very well. So we're now thinking of things like getting a hundred models and doing an optimal design on each and then finding the sort of best compromise protocol. So who is next? The same question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so on some of the traces you showed, were you forcing it with chaotic signals? You, you had some Sorry? ramps, but it looked like you also had some sort of chaotic looking time series. Um, These ones here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what this is, this is uh, three sine waves uh, superimposed on each other. Um, so I can roughly give you an idea of what we kind of discovered that did. So it, it wasn't designed using this kind of phase plane thinking, but um, oh, I've got a nice one. Yeah, kind of what it turns out it does the uh, three sine waves is first the big sine wave um, pushes your activation towards one so that you get in the range where you can measure. Um, and then the higher frequency sine waves make you make all sorts of movements while you're in this uh, high range. And then the lower frequency one kind of pushes you back again and then it pushes you there. So it just means it kind of pushes you into the measurable range and the higher ones do more interesting things. That's the best sort of intuitive explanation that I've been able to come up with for why we have that. Uh, thanks for your great talk, Michael. Um, I'm just curious, because you mentioned the residuals or the, the discrepancies that you see, do you think, so it sounded like you think that these discrepancies are be, sort of half um, meaning, so they're not just noise that uh, may be correlated from your experiments. So what stops you, since and you, your time series measurements seem to be quite dense uh, in, in these experiments, so what stops you from simply trying to improve the mechanism that you capture in your model 
to try to model these discrepancies if you think that they are uh, meaningful? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the the most practical answer I could give is we, we tried and we got better fits and then worse predictions. So um, the, the, the simplest thing I can show you actually where this one is uh, now. Actually, other people in our group have been working on a slightly more complicated model, which seems to do better. Um, where is it? Sorry, yeah. So you can see here um, where this model kind of doesn't see these areas where it doesn't quite fit the exponential sort of decaying bit. Um, if you just fit a single exponential to that, you can never do it. If you fit two exponentials, you can. And from that, biologists go like, right, so that means that this process that's active must, there must be two things active there that both are exponential or a single by exponential. But, you know, for me, it's the same. Um, so that's the kind of most obvious thing to add in next to the model. And we've done that, and then you get much nicer fits, but the predictions get worse. And we don't really know why. Does that mean that... Um, it's, it's hard to tell, then, if this is some experimental thing is causing it to look like that, um, and that's why the predictions of the simpler model are right, or if just maybe like we didn't have enough data, or maybe it, we don't really know. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Michael again.